Okay, yes, thanks uh, Maureen, Sarah, and Nabosa, and I guess Mohammed for letting me speak again here uh, on the uh, on my research. And today, I guess it's a bit unusual as I'll actually talk about what I wrote in the abstract and the title I submitted back in December. So good to hear that. So just as a brief introduction, my uh, my laboratory studies how optimus function. You now you probably heard that from a couple of, you know, I think at a few students give their flash talks uh, during, during the break or before the break. And so we study how optimus function. We're not so much interested in selection or developing biosensors. We sort of do structure function activities. We use a variety of biophysical methods. And what I'm gonna talk about today is mostly isothermal titration calorimetry. We do a number of other methods as well. Um, we do structural studies, looking at aptimer structure and dynamics using NMR spectroscopy. But I won't be talking about that much today. Um, so here's the cocaine binding aptimer on the right. And it's a uh, three-way junction molecule. It has this uh, tandem AG mismatch at the center and a dinucleotide bulge. And it's the three-way junction is where the uh, high affinity binding site is located. Now, I've been studying the cocaine binding after for quite a number of years now. And it really has a couple of facets that really keep me interested. The first being that it's unusual and that it binds ligands other than, the, other than what it was selected to bind much tighter. So it's originally you know, cocaine binding aptimer selected to bind cocaine, but it also binds quinine at uh, approximately 50 fold tighter than it binds cocaine. So we've looked at that over the years. I also mentioned that it binds a number of other quinine based ligands, uh, which are almost all, well, they are, are all anti malarial compounds. You know, some of them much tighter in the order of, you know, 37 nanomolar for chloroquine, 35 for mefloquine, and amodiaquine is also quite tightly bound. But I'm not going to talk about this today, but it just gives you a bit of a background. And the other interesting facet of this aptimer is that it has a structure switching binding mechanism. And you know, that's what makes it useful for uh, being a model system for developing biosensors. And it's structure switching binding mechanism, sometimes I prefer to call it ligand induced folding, um, is for constructs that have a short stem one. So here's stem one, you know, when we have three base pairs, it's unfolded in the free state with ligand binding, the aptimer folds up. If the, uh, uh, we have a different construct called MN4, and it has six base pairs, it's stem one is shown here, is folded in the free state, binds uh, cocaine, and it retains its structure. So there's no structure switching going on. As a final bit of background, we studied this a number of years ago, and we looked at everything from one base pair through to seven base pairs in the stem one here. And we saw the actual breakpoint is between three and four. So when there's four base pairs or more, we have a pre-folded aptimer and it binds uh, relatively tightly compared to these uh, one, two, and three base pair long stem ones, which uh, display, display weaker binding, but have this ligand induced folding property. So what I thought a number of years ago, you know, I, I really like, you know, I really like, uh, I really like my job and being a professor and getting to follow uh, all these weird ideas I get. And I like playing around with the structures. And I thought, what would happen if we have a two base pair molecule that we'll just call this MN24. It's the same as uh, OR8 in the previous slide with two base pairs. So we have two base pairs in stem one. It should be unfolded in the free state, but we have two dangling nucleotides, a G and a C. So if quinine comes in and binds, we know OR8 itself binds quite weakly uh, if we have a dangling nucleotide, a dangling 5 prime G, it binds a lot tighter. Um, we don't know what a dangling G and C will do though. So 
we assume quinine binds, aptamer folds up, and we have this uh, uh, sort of dangling end. And what we thought would happen is it would interact with uh, a second MN4 molecule. And what would happen is the ligand bound first aptamer should pre-organize a second unbound aptamer. Now, if it bound, binds a second aptamer, which isn't bound and pre-organizes it, this second binding site should be significantly tighter as it's more equivalent to a, a you know, something that has a long stem one. And what would happen is quinine would come in and bind and you have uh, you know, it's this sort of a complex dimer, uh, head, you know, tail to tail, I don't know what to name it, but you have a dimer of aptamers each bound to a ligand. And a basic question we have is, you know, will binding be cooperative? You know, will this happen? And the fact that I'm talking today is, you know, we do think it happens. I'm not gonna end my talk here. We do think this is what's going on. And I'll just present some ITC-based binding analysis of this uh, MN4, MN24 construct. So here's the raw ITC. The red line is fitting it just to a one-to-one -one model and it doesn't fit well. We can bind, we can fit the ITC data to a cooperative model or an independent, so two-site cooperative or two-site independent model. I'm not going to bore you with the numbers, but the key point is the residual sum of the squared differences. The lower the RSS value gives us an idea of which model best fits the data, and the cooperative model does best fit the data for MN24. And we have a Hill coefficient, which is a kind of a measure of cooperativity of 1.4. So we expanded this and did a, you know, did a larger study on this idea. And we kept the stem one length at two base pairs, but we made the overlapping region change from two to four to six base pairs. So what we're doing is making this inter helix longer as we increase the overlap region. And I just sort of give me the notation here to remind myself. So two plus six, which means oh, two base pairs in stem one, six in the overlapping region for inter helix of 10 base pairs. We you know, won't get into the details, but all of these, Two additional aptamers did show cooperative binding. We have the lower, you know, we have an RSS value that best uh, that indicates the cooperative model best fits the data. I will admit that you know it's some you know it's quite hard to judge by eye. You know, maybe this one's a good example of a cooperative fit. The data fits a bit nicer to the cooperative model at the beginning points than the independent fit does. So the solid line is the FET and the data are the circles. For MN26, again, the cooperative model fits the data best. And uh, at this point, Hill coefficient has dropped. So just to look at a summary of what's going on, you know, essentially what we show is that as the inter helix lengthens, as the two aptomeric sites get further apart, you know, perhaps you would expect this, but it's interesting to show it that the cooperativity decreases. So we change the Hill coefficient from 1.4 to 1.2. Um, you could round this off to 1.1 if you want, or you can just say 1.07. So as we get the uh, two atomeric sites further apart, measure of cooperativity, the cooperativity becomes weaker. This is kind of similar. We, if, you know, a number of years ago, I talked at the aptamers meeting, I talked about the ATP binding aptamer. And in that case as well, as we move the two binding sites in the ATP aptamer further apart, uh, the co-op, you know, the heel coefficient decrease. So it's, it's similar to what we saw with the ATP binding aptamer. We did a number of other things, looked at a number of other constructs to test the length of stem one. So in these constructs, we vary the length of stem one. We've already looked at MN25, where we have two base pairs in stem one. We put in three base pairs in stem one, four base pairs in stem one, 
and five base pairs in STEM1. Uh, I'm not going to show the ITC data, but the only construct that shows cooperative binding is when we have two base pairs in STEM1. With three, four, and five, what we saw previously with four and five, the aptamer is preformed. So it's not surprising that it's also preformed and doesn't show cooperative binding. Instead, the two binding sites are independent. But it's interesting with uh, three, the three base pairs in STEM1, this is equivalent to the MN19 I showed in my introduction, where at least when there's no dangling or no, yeah, no overlap region attached, it's unfolded. In this case, it, you know, it must be pre-folded and uh, you know, we have independent binding observes. But independent binding is what we observe. So you know, just to summarize, you know, binding switches independent from cooperative binding at the point where you have three base pairs in STEM1. I think this is the end of my talk. I mean, I know it's the end of the talk. So just to summarize, uh, cooperative binding, you know, I was very happy to find that cooperative binding could be designed into the cocaine binding aptamer by this uh, pre-organization scheme using binding at one aptamer to pre-organize a second aptamer unit. Now, of course, you know, what we've left out is any discussion now, how is this useful or, you know, what use of this is, and we haven't done any, uh, any work on this quite yet. Other aptamers that have designed in cooperativity have proven to be a bit more, have a lower, more greater sensitivity, a lower concentration limit of detection when used as a biosensor application. Uh, I would expect this would be similar for the cocaine binding aptamer, we just have to, uh, do a, do a test to, to show it, I mean, might not be, we'll, we'll find out. And, you know, I think this uh, scheme of uh, being a, we all should be able to extend this concept into other structure switching aptamers. Uh, you know, it has to be a structure switching aptamer in order to, you know, pre-organize it and hopefully uh, design in cooperativity. Uh, I think uh, the three-way junction aptamer works well in this regards, but I, you know, I've been thinking about how to extend it to other aptamers. So you know, we'll see what I can come up with over the next little while. And I'll just finish off by thanking the people in my lab. A number of them have already given their flash talks and have their poster available. Uh, Sajana and Nuseba did all of the experimental work on, on uh, this project. Uh, Rahith, Aaron, and uh, Zach have also uh, contributed over the years to lots of projects in my lab. And I'll mention Miguel Neves, who's now has a, a faculty position in Portugal, who's also carrying on some Aptima research and you know, may join us here in future years. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm.